And now our closing keynote for Crazy and Ambitious has a fantastic title, Does It Make Any Sense to Be Crazy and Ambitious? And we're very fortunate to have a man who's been the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment since 2017. Please, homai te please welcome Simon Upton. Oh, kia ora tato. Um, did you think that was a disrespectful title? Does it make any sense to be crazy and ambitious? Um, <clears throat> I did ask the question seriously. Um, is it a sign of the times that we have to sell biodiversity management as crazy and ambitious? Um, you'd think it should just be fundamental that we collect information and we fund research on biodiversity because it's the thing which matters most to us as uh, relatively recent dwellers in these ancient lands. Crazy or ambitious, is it that we're worried that we can't keep anyone's attention for more than five minutes unless we use this sort of, you know, language which revs everybody up? Or is it more serious than that? Is it that the problem is so challenging that nothing measured or incremental will cut the mustard. Now, I'm not going to make an apology for this, but the thoughts that I'm going to give you today have been written very much with scientists in mind, and the unseen army that tries to do painstaking work to make sense of what is happening. Because they're often unknown people, except in their local community, but they are doing fantastic work uh, over decades, and without them we would be even uh, worse off. There's no doubting the scale of the challenge. Uh, this intergovernmental science policy platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services IPBES, it's uh, IPCC is so much easier. Uh, I, th whoever thought of that one in the middle of the night in a biological conference, bi a biodiversity conference, really, they, they didn't do us a kindness. But the IPBES estimates that 25% of animal and plant species assessed globally are threatened with extinction. Our own environment, Aotearoa, reports higher figures for New Zealand's native species. 35% of assessed species are classified as at risk or threatened. Now, you are, I'm sure, all familiar with many of the drivers. Uh, they're more fashionably called wicked problems these days, such as intensification and expansion of agriculture, urban expansion, particularly in coastal settings, ongoing loss of indigenous habitat, and of course, invasive species. But switching off any of these drivers is either nearly impossible, and I think of pest and weed eradication, or involves making very difficult trade-offs on which we do not have social consensus, like halting urban expansion or de-intensifying agricultural production. We are making small wins for intensively managed species, kākāpō, tākahē, kiwi. But beyond that, biodiversity is overwhelmingly being lost across our landscape despite recent efforts. Now, this uh, national challenge doesn't specifically address the impact of climate change on our biodiversity. But on top of all the other problems, we know that climate is only going to exacerbate the existing challenges and will also bring some brand new ones into contention. Let me give you three factoids chosen from many potential candidates. The DOC Niwa report on sea level determined that 260 ecosystem management units, which are defined as sites identified to be best examples of ecosystem types and large enough to provide a functioning example, so that's the words which lie behind ecosystem type, 
and 99 species management units, and those are defined as identified as critical for the long-term security of one or more species. Okay, so 260 ecosystem management units, 99 species management units are within potential coastal inundation zones. And the sea levels are rising. Factoid two, Tuatara have temperature determined six. 21 degrees in the burrow makes females, 22 degrees makes males. That's being slightly simplistic, but the probability moves. There's an observed decline in the percentage of females in the population on North Brother Island. Nice piece of research to back that up. Third factoid, even widespread and hardy flora and fauna could be at risk. An unusually wet winter, and my goodness, it was. I've never seen a farm as wet as the place I live. Followed by summer drought, and again, I haven't experienced a drought like it where I live, has resulted in large areas of dead trees across the Nelson Marlborough region, including common species like mahoi and beech. These have been noted in Kaharangi and Abel Tasman National Parks. So extreme weather events such as this and others are projected to become more frequent in the future. So there's a whole bundle of risks unpicking what has, since the Ice Age, evolved to be where things are at in our forests. And we still have issues with huge data gaps on species. Simply recording the existence of things let alone understanding their requirements or their functions. This is particularly so for less charismatic taxonomic groups such as lichens, mosses, liverworts and invertebrates, let alone the microbial organisms which don't feature at all. I think if you're trying to sell biodiversity conferences, some of those are unlikely to draw the crowds. And because most marine species are well beyond our reach, and invisible, the tasks of describing our marine biota is in even worse shape. Even here on land, we know surprisingly little about how many of our vertebrate species, seabirds, for example, uh, are faring. But by comparison, we know next to nothing about most invertebrates. Now, botanists in the room would probably agree that we have a similar situation with our plants. G could you put your hand up if you're a botanist? I wrote this paragraph, especially for botanists. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so there are some people who, eight. There are some botanists here. We know more about the bigger vascular species, but less about other groups such as lichens and mosses. My wife's first cousin once removed, the late Dame Ella Campbell, devoted her life to bryophytes, which is the, the composite name for liverworts, hornworts, and mosses. It's just as well she had a long life. She died at 93 because she was virtually alone in her endeavors. And that is, and I'm not joking, truly the case in this country, there are bits of our biodiversity where a single car accident removes a very significant chunk of our knowledge. Microbiologists here will be able to give, I've written similar examples of solitary endeavors or black holes, but I think it's more at the black hole end there. It's fairly scary. But clearly we need to go beyond describing species. We need a better understanding of how our ecosystems function. Understanding functionality will make us better placed to restore and protect ecosystems, and also respond to growing threats such as climate change. Although the land area of Aotearoa New Zealand is comparatively small, it's not a trivial task to try to manage it. And of course, that is without mentioning our much vaster marine estate where there are just so many unknowns. And as you know, we have a high proportion of endemic species I didn't, because I've, I've not been interested in them. You know, you can't be interested in everything in this life. I'm, I've been a ferns man. I'm more of a plants man than an animals man. But, but, but I understand there are 110 
species of lizard, which are completely endemic in New Zealand. That's pretty amazing, 110 totally native species. Um, so even if you had unlimited resources, and we don't, we couldn't fill all the data gaps that exist and fill them fast enough to counter the threats that are emerging. We're a small country with a small scientific community. So how do we prioritize what we focus on in the near and medium term? Now, you knew all of what I said, or almost to this point. Now I'm going to tell you why I'm asking that question. I'm currently undertaking a review of the Environmental Reporting Act, which was passed in 2015, four years ago. Because we've just reached the completion of the first full cycle of the Act, which is five domain reports and a synthesis report. And it seems a good time to stand back and say, well, is this reporting system delivering value? Is it achieving what we want from it? And I'll be delivering that review um, later this year. The Act requires the Secretary for the Environment and the government statistician to work together to produce regular reports on the state of the environment. Every six months, they must produce a report on one of the five environmental domains and then a synthesis report to polish off the cycle every three years. So if you talk to the people who do it, it's a treadmill of report presentation. The Environmental Reporting Act splits the natural world into these five separate domains. And for better or worse, somebody decided, air, climate and atmosphere, land, marine, fresh water. But as we all know, nature doesn't uh, neatly break down into these separate silos. Many environmental issues cross domains. All of them. Interestingly, and you've noted, there isn't a biodiversity domain. To date, biodiversity has been labelled as a cross-domain area. So aspects of it have popped up in the land, freshwater and marine domain reports produced to date. Now, the scope of my review covers the Environmental Reporting Act itself, the structure and implications of the current reporting framework, the wider environmental data system that lies behind it and the roles of various agencies in that system. And my guiding questions are focused, I must tell you, on the underlying data and research. What sort of information is needed to support environmental reporting? What underlying research is needed to inform the collection of the information? What analytical framework is required to present the results of data collection? And those questions are all key ones for biodiversity. If we're going to have any success in managing the growing threats to our biodiversity, we need to have some confidence that we have, one, chosen the right priorities, because you can't do everything. Sorry, small country, small resources, and a society eating away across the board and drivers like climate change eating away as well. So you have to focus, what are the right priorities? Secondly, are we commissioning the right research to inform ourselves about the processes that are involved? And are we collecting the right data and enough of it to assess on an ongoing basis, whether we are making progress. Why collect it if you can't draw a conclusion from what you're collecting? How do we prioritise? What framework do we use? My predecessor, Dr Jan Wright, identified the need to prioritise issues by assessing them against these physical and measurable criteria. And I'm going to read them out. I think Jan got it right. I don't think I need to reinvent this. These are the questions she asked. Is there an irreversible process underway if the issue is left unattended? Secondly, are effects cumulative and that they build over time? Thirdly, is the scale of the issue large or pervasive? Fourth, 
is the pace of the issue accelerating over time? Is the, are the sands running down on our ability to do something? And finally, are the trends likely to tip a natural system over a threshold into another state? And I think the public is starting to understand what that may mean in the context of climate. But of course, we see it in our lakes, eutrophication tipping points where suddenly there's a phase change. What information do we need? Well, a large amount of information has already been collected. And one shouldn't belittle this. New Zealand taxpayers have made big investments over the years. Decades of taxpayer and ratepayer investment has resulted in numerous data sets being generated that can help us understand what's going on. And over the years, several attempts have been made to document the available resources. For instance, back in 2012, when they were preparing for the State of the Environment uh, report, or State of the Environment reporting legislation, Statistics New Zealand characterised environmental data sets and information across multiple domains. And in collaboration with the Ministry for the Environment and DOC, data gaps were identified and the Environment Domain Plan 2013 was developed to fill those. And it's an interesting document to go and look at, as I have in the context of this review. Interestingly, ecosystems and biodiversity was one of the 10 domains of focus. Now, building on that effort, recent State of the Environment reports have documented available indicators and data sets across domains alongside key information and knowledge gaps. And I often think it's the most interesting thing in these reports that MFE and stats have put out. It's the, it's the, it's the, the data gaps bit. And, and as I've said to most audiences, if you haven't looked at the, the, the last one, the, the land domain, take a look because table four, which gives the gaps, is longer than table three, which gives the data series they drew on. Um, so there are critical gaps. And funding for the maintenance and development of data sets has not been driven by any clearly defined national objectives. Crucially, even when we have information, it's often difficult to assemble time series data that can reveal trends. This is just so crucial. I don't see how you can monitor what's going on and have a strategy for doing something about it if you don't know what's actually going on with time series. But we, that's lacking in many cases. Or if we have it, it's cobbled together, it's been curated by different people and it's not all comparable and, and all of those sort of issues you know about. So a comprehensive rethink of the public good purpose of these data sets, their funding and their accessibility is overdue. Now, I understand that MB is currently undertaking a review of the government's investment in scientific collections and databases. And this review includes, but is not limited, to the 25 nationally significant collections and databases which were identified in 1992 and haven't been reviewed since. And I was the person at the time who commissioned uh, that review. Uh, so nothing's changed since then. Next point, the uneven nature of raw data and our ability to leverage it. That's not a new issue. The first State of the Environment report, which was in 1997, another thing I commissioned, identified this issue of data availability and noted that, and I quote from the report, New Zealand's environmental information must be better coordinated if we are to derive maximum value from it. Unquote. It's the sort of thing that you can say, and you can say it again every five and every ten years, and everyone will agree with you. The question is, are we doing it? Our current biodiversity strategy, released in 2000 but updated in 2016, is coming up for renewal. And while it's had some notable successes, such as raising public awareness, supporting threatened species management programs, it has failed to achieve its core goal, halting biodiversity losses, let alone reverse the direction of change. The difficulty in getting traction is highlighted by the fact that many of the suggested actions continue to be a source of contention. This is the sociological side. Let's be honest about it. The underrepresentation of lowland ecosystems within the national estate or under protection. Lowlands, coastal forests, dunelands, wetlands. Because they're scarce, 
there's lots of potential claimants. There's confusion over the identification and means of protecting significant habitats within the RMA. We're still waiting on the recommended national policy statement to provide consistent national guidance for regional and territorial authorities. So, by our own evaluations and international evaluations, we are still losing biodiversity. Now, I've gone along being quite grim, but let me say there are, I think it, in New Zealand, at least some cause for optimism. I sense, and I've been living overseas for a while, and I've only been back in the last 16, 18 months, I sense that there is community interest across this country and a clear recognition that we really rely on our biodiversity, and I get that feeling more clearly here than in most other countries. Maybe it's because... I'll, Maybe it's because people arrive here wanting to see it. So if other people want to see it, maybe we should be a bit more concerned about it. I'm doing a review of the environmental impact of tourism for later this year as well, so watch that space. But New Zealand has broadly concurred that we need to protect and maintain our environment. 84% apparently agree that pest species are a significant conservation problem. Only 14% think current pest control measures are adequate. 61% are aware of New Zealand's goal to become predator-free by 2050. So someone's doing some good communicating. New Zealanders are more engaged in biodiversity protection than at any point in our recent history. Choosing to spend time in their communities, checking traps, weeding, planting indigenous species in all manner of locations. Um, and if I just can give you my own little contribution, I'm just one. I mean, I've so far in the last 16 months, I've shot or trapped 62 possums, mainly shot, trapped quite a lot. I've got 13 good nature traps out there. I've got three Tim's traps. Um, I uh, have, have got several wetland projects underway. I'm planting thousands of trees. It's all sorts of things, and I go out every weekend and try and shoot something new. Um, <laughs> and I'm just aware that there's neighbours doing this and there's a lot of people doing this. Uh, it was not like that, uh, not so many years ago. So there has been a real change. People are really taking... They realise they've got to fight back. I'd say that we're good at innovating and putting our boots on and getting stuck in them. And the new tourism strategy appears to recognise that what we are selling is in large part our environment and that healthy ecosystems are foundational if the industry is going to be sustainable. So that tourism comes an ally in this case. Furthermore, there seems to be a developing appreciation that we, we should be managing our rural landscapes in a more joined up way where biodiversity is discussed alongside other on-farm environmental issues such as soil erosion, water quality. These things are not are happening in silos. And I recently put out a report entitled Farms, Forests and Fossil Fuels, the Next Great Landscape Transformation Question Mark. Uh, that was an attempt to facilitate some thinking from my part. And if you haven't read it, have a look at it because it starts with climate but it finishes with the landscape. And then finally, central government is pushing to develop coordinated national guidance, a national biodiversity strategy and a national policy statement for indigenous biodiversity together with a tightened up focus for the national policy statement for fresh water. So those are all good things. Don't get me wrong. I think the river's flowing in the right direction. But let me finish where I began by asking whether it makes any sense to be crazy and ambitious in tackling our biodiversity challenges. It would be difficult to argue against ambition. Anything less would be a, a fatalistic acquiescence in serial extinctions. But crazy? I probably show the weariness of advancing years here, but I would prefer a grimmer, steelier signifier. Culturally, New Zealanders are pretty good at taking the piss, being self-deprecating, not respecting boundaries, taking risks. We're pretty good at telling ourselves that, actually, and that's all fine, but the risk is we become enamoured with novelty and iconoclasm and leave the follow-through for other people another day. I've often observed that we're really good at first principles, policy rethinks, but less good at the less theatrical, more meticulous business of sustained implementation where you decide what you need to do, you know why you're doing it, and you stick 
at it. I think we lack support for the sort of dogged, patient, limpet-like application to those vital, less flashy activities like data collection, curation, and interpretation over lengthy periods. I'm just thinking those are good adjectives. So could we have it dogged, patient, limpet-like, and ambitious? It just occurs to me that with, there you are, these three offers. R rather than crazy and ambitious, I, I think we need some words like that, or systematic, focused, prioritized, even myopic. I, I leave you to choose the adjective. Of course, none of them has the same sales appeal as being crazy. But an intense dose of sanity will be required to meet real world challenges, the like of which none of us has ever encountered before. Thank you. We have five minutes for some very sane, focused, and dogged questions. If you'd like to come on stage with us, Simon, thank you so much for your time in this extra five minutes. He's deciding whether he is going to come up and answer some questions. Okay, okay here we go. Here's your microphone. So uh, we also have a ranking system, as you can see. It's all very sane and ordered uh, that people can decide how, how they'd like to support that question. So let's go to the top one. Given that less than 10 people in this room read the Environment Aotearoa report, I'm sorry, that was actually revealed yesterday uh, and arguably we scientists policy makers etc are the prime audience how effective do you think environmental reporting actually is well, hey, just, people are often embarrassed when they're asked these questions so let's just ask the question again how many people in the room have uh, read the environment Aotearoa report or at least you know flick through it I'm sure it's more than 10. Yeah, there you are. You see, they were all embarrassed yesterday. So that's not bad. But I think it's still a fair question. You probably read it like me because it was your professional responsibility to read it. <laughs> and I'm not going to answer the question how effective because that's what my report is going to be. And we truly, honestly, are still working on it, okay? We, we're, it'll, it'll come out in, in, in a few months. But... Uh, I think the ministries have tried hard to produce material in an interesting way and make it available uh, to reach audiences other than just scientists and users, and so full congratulations for that. But it all comes back to those questions that Jan Wright asked about, you know, why are you doing this stuff? Who is your audience? How are you prioritising? I think that's really, those are the questions that I want to answer. And if I answer those, then that might have some bearing on the effectiveness of what we do. Okay, this is a very focused question, so I'll go with this one um, from Peter. New Zealand's fungi, fungi uh, comprise the second largest kingdom of life in New Zealand. What level of research resource is appropriate to move our knowledge from 30% of, of expected New Zealand fungal biodiversity to closer to 50%? I've got no idea, Peter. <laughs> but, I mean, the question is, how, well, what, what level of research do we currently have which has generated the 30%? Where's Peter? Is Peter here? Tell us, what, how much resource is there? Um, there's a national collection of fungi, a national conference collection of living fungi, yep. and a group of 10 people that are working on that collection. Yep. And then we have a national conference of Okay, so assuming you've secured the 10, then roughly what percentage increase do you need? I take it it's sort of, it's not one-on-one, -on -one, it's, there's a, a diminishing marginal return, so you could probably do it for less than another 10 people. Um, oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, quite. And that's why I say there really needs to be a conscious, uh, you know, policy position that this is a permanent, long-run investment that you just have to make, and it won't win you any votes or anything. It's just one of the things that the government of New Zealand does on behalf of everyone because we need to understand the place we're living in. And, and uh, it's, that's where, it's those bits that you always you know, get forgotten. Uh, they should actually be, you know, when a, a new government's elected, the first thing any minister should be told is, now look, there's information. You can't do your job without it. So that bit has got a fence around it. Now, let's talk about all the other priorities. <laughs> but unfortunately, that doesn't get brought up first in my experience. 
from Stephen. Building trust and working in partnership is fundamental and it can't be rushed. Yet science still operates a publish or perish model. How can we make science kinder for early career scientists? Yeah, I, look, I, I'm not being a scientist. I, I, I can't answer that, that question. Um, I mean, you can, the easy answer for everything is funding, isn't it? And so uh, if you can, uh, you can provide some new incentives uh, for people, more postdocs, whatever. Um, but the, the publish or perish model is a cultural thing that's deeper and wider than New Zealand. I think we're into something much bigger here. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I think that's something that you need to tell us about. It's Stephen Hartley, where's Stephen? Yes. I mean, you, you, I mean, you need to, you, you, rather than ask me that question, who, who, who are you advocating something to? I mean, it's reflecting from the conversations Yeah. Competition. Yeah. Well, but, that, but that's... But, Maybe a little bit more yeah, yeah, sure. And that's easy to say. I mean, that, but that's where this sort of painstaking work, I mean, the fact that, you know, the fact that Dame Ella Campbell spent 93 years, I mean, and like so many, but... So many older scientists carried on working when she'd retired and just turned up, you know, like Margot de Menno used to turn up to AgriSearch for years and years and years. I mean, these people devoted their lives. They were people who just made a commitment to a field, and the system has to be able to recognise those people. Now, you're saying, what about what, what young person would ever see them, their, their way to being able to devote their life to a field? And I suppose the answer has to be you need stable funding for these collections, you know, for biosystematics, so that you can actually uh, say to people, look, there is actually a career here. It's a really, really interesting one, too, if you've got that sort of mind. Uh, so I think these roads... Yep, exactly, yep, yep. And I guess it requires crazy and ambitious leadership in academia as well. Uh, so it's also dogged and sane and very patient. Limpet-like, limpet-like. That was my best one. Or, yes. a, a, or power. How about a power? Oh, okay, right. Thank power you so much, Simon, right. for all your time. Tēnā koe. Hō mai te pake pake.